Hi, I'm Justin Jamore, and I'm Matt Littleton, and we're here to talk to you today about photography. Now, humans have always been visual creatures. We like our images. Perhaps this is why we like paintings, landscapes, portraits, and photography so much. While a camera itself is, is a complex system, the optical principles behind it really aren't that complex. Today we're going to discuss both digital and analog cameras, how they differ, and how they capture light. While they may be different, both digital and analog cameras utilize a very important tool in optical mechanics, the lens. Now, for more on lenses, we go to Justin. Thanks, Matt. Many times in photography, you find yourself in a predicament which you cannot get all the things in the shot that you wish to. What is unknown to most people, however, is that what kind of picture you have relies greatly on what kind of lens you have attached to your camera. The function of a lens is to focus the light entering it onto a film or digital recorder. Each lens has what's called a focal length, measured in millimeters, that measures how strongly it focuses or diverges light. In more layman terms, the focal length is a measurement of how much of a lens, how much of a given scene a lens can take in. Many times, if you've ever been to a sporting event, you see photographers on the sidelines with many different lenses attached to their cameras. They all look different, but they serve the same purpose, to get that great shot that they're all looking for. But can lenses affect the kind of pictures that it's taken, though? Let's find out. As you can see on the screen, the light rays are parallel and never converge, meaning that they will never form an image. Once a converging lens is added, however, you get convergence, and therefore an image. As you can see in this particular biconvex lens, convergence happens around 7.5 centimeters, which qualifies it as what's called a normal lens. Normal lenses are best used to take pictures with perspective that matches that of the human eye. If you're standing somewhere and you see something interesting and want to capture it just as you see it, a normal lens is the best choice. These lenses tend to have a focal length of around 50 millimeters and take the best shots when standing a slight distance from the target. But Justin, what if you want to take a panoramic top shot? Matt, that's a great question. You would have to use what's called a wide-angle lens to achieve such a feat. You mean you can use a combination of lenses to produce an overall shorter focal length, and thus a wide-angle shot? Exactly. By adding another biconvex lens to our first one, you achieve a focal length shorter than our original, which results in a picture with a much larger viewing angle. Well, that's great and all, but sometimes I would take a picture of something that's far away. How can I do that? It's actually quite simple. All you do is use a different combination of lenses to achieve an overall focal length of anything over 70 millimeters. As you can see in this example, the use of a biconvex and biconcave lens give us, give us this, meaning we can take pictures of objects further away. While lenses are great and all, there's nothing without the cam their camera counterparts. Matt, what can you tell us about the ba most basic type of camera? That's right, Justin. We're going to talk about some more specific types of cameras, starting with the most basic, a pinhole camera. The pinhole camera is an example of a point-and-shoot camera, meaning it has no lens, so it can't zoom, but also doesn't need to be focused. It consists of a light-proof chamber with a small hole punched in one side and filmed directly across from that hole. When light enters the chamber, it is allowed to expose the film and thus form an inverted image. Here we have an example of a pinhole camera. It is made out of a peanut can with a small hole punched in the bottom and a piece of tape covering the hole that serves as the shutter. When the shutter is lifted, the aperture is exposed to light, the film, which is located directly across on the lid of the can, is allowed to be exposed and thus an image is formed. Next we'll move to a more common type of camera, the SLR, or Single Lens Reflex Camera. Here we have a cross section of an analog camera. As you can see, as discussed earlier, we have a combination of lenses in here whose job it is to focus the light, a prism up top with the eyepiece, we'll talk about that in just a minute, the film along the very back wall here, and the shutter directly over the film. As light enters the camera, as we discussed earlier, it goes through the, the series of lenses and is converged right on the film, which right now is being covered by the shutter because we're not quite ready to take a picture. There's one more element in here that's not being shown yet, which is known as the hinged mirror. The hinged mirror's duty is to reflect the focus light up into the prism so that it can reach the eyepiece. Here we have the light going in, 
reflecting once, twice in the prism and coming out through the eyepiece and into your eye so you can see what you're taking a picture of. Now when the shutter button is actually pressed, the hinge mirror swings up, the shutter raises, and the film is allowed to be exposed. When light reaches the film, it is absorbed and causes a slight chemical reaction which produces a very rudimentary image on the film. Through a process known as development, the film is placed in other chemicals that react with it in such a way as to perform the final image that you pick up in a grocery store. Now we'll go back to Justin for an extensive discussion on digital photography. Thanks, Matt. Digital photography is really not that much different from analog. While older cameras use film, newer cameras use digital sensors to record the amount of color that is received from each point of a picture being taken. In each camera, there are millions of arrays of pixels that help, when combined, to form the complete image. When you press the shutter button, the sensors are temporarily exposed and begin to receive photons of color that enter through the lens. Each one of these sensors then closes itself off to the exposure is complete. The camera then attempts to measure the amount of each color inside, but there's no easy way of doing this. Instead, colored filters are placed in certain patterns across all the sensors so that they only need to calculate how much of each one color entered at a given point. What this means, however, is that the camera has to approximate how much each how much of each of the two colors the image should have at any given point because it is only measuring one. The most common array of colors that is placed over the sensors is what's called a Bayer array. It exists of alternating rows of red-green and blue-green filters. This array is noted for having twice as many green filters as blue or red because the human eye is more apt to liking green light. When the picture is reconstructed from the measurement that the sensors make for each given color, it looks something like this. We hope we've been able to teach you guys a little bit more about analog digital photography. So for Justin Jamore, I'm Matt Littleton. And we were going to think of some inspirational photography quote to leave you with, but we couldn't find one, so we're just going to press this easy button. That was easy.